I will call the roll. Let it show that all of council is present. Recording secretary, acting CAO, and administration. And I will call the meeting to order. Are there any additions to the agenda? I don't have an, an addition, but what I'd like to see. I don't have an addition, but what I'd like to see is our appointments moved before finance so our presenters can finish their presentations and then leave more promptly. Actually, I think we'll move it up to 4.1. 4.1. Okay. I believe we're. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? Thank you, Willis. All in favor? Carried. Lou, welcome. Come on in. And nice to see you again. Thank you, uh, Mayor Sorry, and Council. Mayor. Uh, uh, sir, if I could just, are we, if this is four point, we're going to move it before 4.0? No, no. So we're. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank yeah. you very much. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, we adopted the agenda. Well, no, you didn't ask for additions. You, I asked for additions. Yeah, and then um, Mr. Lowe put his hand up. And, then, and it was the same addition. Uh, okay, okay, you didn't add. To, to, to move. Okay, did, do you have something to add as well? No. Okay, you didn't ask if you wanted, if there were any other. Sorry? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I have additional ag uh, agenda items that I'd like to put on. So. All right. We have already taken that vote, though, so Madam Secretary, is that an issue? Well, Council does, pardon me, Council does have the ability, and because the Mayor did not ask for any other additions, it was just that one item, let's just ignore the fact that the uh, agenda was passed and go ahead and add your items to it. Is that fair? Okay, thank you. Um, 9.2, under old business, if we could add citizen engagement. Um, 9.3, update on the code of conduct, um, updating, I suppose. Uh, 9.4, a uh, reserve account update. And then under new business, uh, land use bylaw amendments for 10.1 and 10.2 uh, mill rate comparison, please. Mr. Harris, sorry, can you just repeat some of those? I'm at 9.2, citizen engagement, 9.3, code of conduct. Uh, yeah, just to update. Uh, 9.4. Is reserve account update. 10.1 would be land use bylaw amendments. And 10.2, mill rate comparison. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to accept again. Willis, will you uh, put the motion? Yeah, I'll put the motion. Okay. Motion to accept is amended. All in favor? Carried. Sorry. Lou. Okay, <clears throat> tonight I'm here to present the third quarter policing report. Uh, I'll start off. I did have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I think everybody has a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Can you just give me a second? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> jurisdiction, the Morongo RCMP detachment provides, uh, as you know, a 24-hour policing service to several communities and municipalities, the town of Givens, Lacsonan, town of Morinville, Bonacourt, uh, Alexander First Nation, and CFE uh, Edmonton. Next slide. The human resources at Morinville detachment uh, is comprised of 34 personnel one staff sergeant, one sergeant, five corporals, uh, 18 plus one constables, four public servants, employees, and four town of uh, Morinville employees. Officers are supported by Sturgeon uh, County uh, Victim Services. We have nine in total, and we have five uh, guards at the detachment. 
On the provincial side, of the 16 established provincial uh, positions, we have 14 officers that are currently working. Uh, two officers are away on special leave, one uh, parental and one on medical. Uh, one position has been backfilled to ensure coverage, and one position has two officers uh, assigned uh, to one position, which is being normalized. Uh, right now we have two art vacancies, uh, the staff sergeant uh, vacancy in Morinville and plus one of the corporal positions on the, uh, on the watch. So those are being uh, in progress of being filled. Uh, of the four established positions, they are all currently working uh, in Morinville. So the community priorities for uh, 2023 to 24. Uh, Morville detachment is focused on the following community priorities. Ospot patrols, the numbers from Ospot patrols from October to December have accumulated up to uh, 721 completed. Uh, proactive patrols and the lock it or lose it. These programs we're finding are very beneficial, not only in crime reduction and actually uh, uh, catching some of the perpetrators that are committing uh, crimes within our communities. And that's uh, awareness, uh, education, so community engagement. We've uh, been active involved with uh, Coffee with a Cop, uh, Pop with a Cop, uh, that's uh, with our youth in the communities, uh, the Candy Cane Check Stop, participation in a rural crime watch. We just had a meeting here last week in uh, Gibbons. Uh, participation in the Youth Advisory Committee of Surgeon County and participation in the Alexander Justice uh, Community Committee. Uh, workplace in, in, in employee uh, wellness and respect. Uh, we are actually dealing with, because we have to look at internally of our, our <laughs> folks internally and been actively involved in team building activities in that area. Enhanced road safety, ongoing violation <coughs> tickets, as you know, uh, that's on, ongoing. Uh, radar enforcement and uh, traffic uh, check stop initiatives that we've uh, come up. So sometimes you'll see the uh, photo radar people that are out alongside of the roads, uh, enforcement that uh, as well. Uh, crime reporting, uh, for this quarter, what we're seeing compared to last year, Person's crime is down from 91 to 82 in 2023. We've seen a 9% decrease uh, from the previous year. Uh, property crime is down from 248 to 192 in uh, 2023, and we've seen a 26% decrease uh, from the uh, uh, previous year. What's not up on the slide is the other criminal code is down uh, 57 uh, to 44 in 2023 with a 23% decrease in uh, in that area. However, our criminal code traffic is up from 16 to 22, which gives us about a 38% uh, increase. Uh, provincial code uh, traffic uh, is down from 664 from previous year to 568 in 2023 with a decrease of 14%. Uh, we're seeing that. So that's the, the crime stats, and one of the things I'm, I'm putting forward to council and municipality as we come in uh, this 2024, 2025, is seeking input from council on policing priorities uh, within uh, uh, the stuff. Uh, I know in previous years, we submit the policing priorities, and one of the things that we wanna make sure that our priorities are in alignment with the uh, with the communities, so we're seeking input uh, to make sure that we are uh, coming in alignment <coughs> with the communities. Community engagement is crucial to our work uh, at the Morinville Detachment. Uh, as you see, that some of the activities that we're doing in the communities is uh, we want to increase the community engagement uh, within the uh, uh, community. So as we plan for the next year. We would like to hear from the town of Gibbons about the key areas they think uh, we should focus on uh, with that. So I really appreciate any feedback coming from uh, council on that. So uh, one of the things that I 
have uh, started uh, in Morinville is working uh, closer with uh, council and the uh, and the communities to make sure that we're all uh, coming on the same page on that. So that's it for my report. Lou, with regards, you said the property crimes are down. Correct. Is there a significant reason they're down, or are they just not being reported? There could be. Uh, it's a valid point and, and a good question that you're asking. It's uh, we're seeing a couple of things. Is that we do have prolific offenders, and having prolific offenders, they commit eighty percent of the, uh, the the crime. So uh, once we uh, get those pe folks incarcerated. We do see a dramatic increase in, uh, especially in property crime, and uh, thefts and that as well. So that is is one of the things, and I think part of it also is our uh, crime reduction strategies that we're uh, having. Our uh, hotspot patrols are very effective, uh, as as we know them. And the feedback that I'm receiving now, especially in the community from the communities is that they're seeing more of us uh, on on the roads of that as well. G. So as you know, public safety is a big thing for me. And um, with our community being the second largest in the county, I just have three questions. Would you rather I rifle them through or go one at a time? Uh, you can go one at a time and I'll answer each Sounds one. good, I'll give you the easiest one first. Uh, have your members been using the, the a beat office or is there any talks about doing that in the community? The office here in, 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 uh, in Gibbons. Gibbons. Uh, we haven't because it's not set up yet as uh, as we uh, move forward. Okay, but that's something that's in the books that we're looking yes. at moving forward. Yeah. Great, great to hear. And then uh, what does the Youth Advisory Committee entail and how does that benefit Gibbons? The Youth Advisory Committee, that's uh, a committee with the uh, Sturgeon County and uh, <clears throat> they have some very good uh, folks on on there, and and I one of the first meetings I went there, I was really impressed with the uh, with the youth in our uh, community. There is a cross section from all over. There there may be representation from Givens, and I know in Sturgeon County and and Bonacourt and Legale. So there uh, there's cross sections there with the uh, the youth in 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 the community. I tried to sign them up for the RCMP, but I didn't get any grabbers at this uh, point in time. But we'll keep trying. Okay. Yeah. So, like, the benefit for Givens is that we have a seat at the table and there's engagement there with our youth? I believe there is uh, okay. on it. I know, that <clears throat> I know when I was at the meeting, there was uh, a face-to-face -face meeting, and also there was uh, people that were uh, on uh, live uh, feed. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So there's quite a few there. And then you also noticed uh, between criminal, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you notice the difference between uh, for your traffic uh, going up and down uh, with the provincial one uh, going down and then the criminal traffic going up. Am I correct on that one? Uh, that's correct. Uh, and I think one of the things that we've, we've done is that uh, the impaired uh, sanctions that we are actually, uh, we're getting a lot of those. Okay. Uh, that as well. And you know that uh, by legislation, if we're stopping vehicles, it's mandatory uh, that they uh, uh, blow into the, uh, uh, into the ASD. So do you think with the use of the APIS program, the provincial mandated regulated body there that's kind of trying to streamline a bit of those traffic tickets for the province, do you think that's assisted? in doing more traffic that's more meaningful for the officers? Uh, it is, and, and I think when <coughs> Morinville, Morinville is complemented by uh, uh, traffic west section, so they operate in our areas and that as well. Uh, sometimes if you see uh, people that'll come into town of Givens and they're doing traffic enforcement, uh, that's from Capital West uh, traffic because they hit all the communities and that as well in there. Okay, thank you. I just noticed a lot of activity lately with uh, traffic stops around the area, so that's all. Yes, and, and, and that's one thing of note. Even to say that we, we do have limited resources in Morinville, if I need to get 20 police officers here, I can have them within 30 to 40 minutes, so or more, as you know. Yeah.
One of the priorities that I see, and I'm really happy to see you're, you are engaging in it already, is public engagement, getting to know people one-to-one uh, -one and getting a sense of what their priorities are and what's going on in their lives I think is really important. Yep. Uh, secondly, on your report I notice that the number of incidents of spousal abuse has gone down from 60 to 37. I absolutely love to see that. It, the, the incidence of spousal abuse has been through the roof and Alberta is does not look good in that regard, so I'm quite happy to see that going down. Yeah, thank you. I'll move acceptance of as information. All in favor? Gary, Lou, thank you very much for coming out. Thank you, and it's we a will pleasure. be in contact, and we Perfect. will get on the priorities for this year. All right, well thanks for having me. Uh, well, so for, I know all of you and you know me, but uh, for those uh, that maybe don't, I'm James McDonald, I'm the Executive Director at Northern Lights Library System. We're headquartered in Elk Point. Um, and I have three lovely ladies from, from your local library board here as well. So appreciate you coming. And, and thank you to Lorraine who sits on our, uh, our board and, uh, and our policy committee and is a great help. So you should have the value statements up on the screen there. And I'll just run a little bit through this and, and talk a little bit, uh, you know, for those in the room and online, uh, what Northern Lights is. We're a municipality-driven organization. People, uh, you pay a levy to be a member of Northern Lights Library System. You're a partner with 61 other communities, which is pretty impressive. I don't know of any other uh, organization where you have that many participating municipalities. Um, this includes two Métis settlements um, and one reserve, which is pretty great. And I'm happy to report that Legal, your neighbors, have joined Northern Lights, and so you will have some well-read neighbors eventually. Just give them a little bit of time. Um, Legal is not the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, okay, so... Uh, you circulated in uh, 2023 16,493 print books to your community's um, residents. Um, you get a, a weekly van, re van delivery uh, coming to the community to pick up books and, and deliver those to others and also deliver books to you. Um, we are partners with three other regional library systems. So while we have 61 municipalities, there's more than 200 libraries participating. That means the the members of your residents here have access to more than three and a half million uh, library items, which is pretty impressive. Uh, you took out uh, a little over 2,000 e-books and 1,200 uh, e-audio books. Um, and of course, we provide uh, other things besides just the circulation and the you know, materials in the library system. We also have professional librarians that your library can tap into. Uh, we help with policy, we help with program development, we have summer and winter reading programs. Um, and so we add in here, you know, you had 26 tickets with the system and we kind of give a best guess on what that would cost. Really, it would cost you quite a bit more. You'd have to hire several staff to, to get the breadth and depth uh, of that. To be a member, you pay uh, $5.39. That that'll be what your 2024 level le levy is per resident. That's based on 2019 population figures. We use the 2019 population figures because that is what the province uses to generate your operating grant. Uh, so you get about $17,000 to be a member of Northern Lights. Out of this, we take a book allotment. It's $2.15 per person. So, you, uh, And on top of that, the county is a member. So you get your library gets a book allotment from the county as well, a portion of, of theirs. Uh, and so you get back $15,609 uh, as a result of that to your library for the purchase of, of books. So it doesn't go to our operating. 
You also, because Sturgeon County is, uh, am I, am I, I might be in the wrong county here. It's Sturgeon County, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so because Sturgeon County is, uh, is a member, you get a rural services grant. It works out to that changes from year to year based on the statistics, et cetera. But uh, this last year was $17,564. Um, so when you look at just this, basically just this circulation value, uh, not including all the internet and et cetera support that we give you, um, you're getting back in value $458 for every dollar that you invest in the library system which is pretty impressive. If, you're, if your residents had decided, you know, instead of a library, we're just gonna purchase the materials that we, we want, we'll go to Amazon, we'll go to Audible, we'll do you know, those types of things, they would have spent $670,000 uh, to the 17,000 that you invested. So that's, pretty, that's a pretty good return on investment. 984 library cards are out there. I know on the slide it says library users. Um, Every year, I think I got to change that because it's not that's not accurate. A lot of families will have one library card for the whole family, um, so there's 984 cards out there, uh, which is pretty good out of population of 3,100. And like I say, uh, on the other side here, we get a little bit more of a system value on the second uh, slide. Uh, the 177,000 people that we do uh, provide service for in Northeast Alberta here. Um, the circulation value is $28 million. We circulate more than 800, almost 800,000 physical items to, to the people in Northeast Alberta and 144, almost 145,000 uh, electronic uh, e-books and audio books uh, this last year, which is pretty, pretty impressive. We bought 20,000 new books uh, for our libraries. Um, but again, we're part of TRAC. Those three other regional library systems are purchasing uh, as many or more. And so your library, that's over 100,000 brand new items that, that your library uh, and your residents have access to, access to as a result. So you're getting a pretty good uh, bang for your buck. Um, Northern Lights is doing really well, I think. Um, we, we are working really hard to be efficient with the resources that we're given from the 61 partners. Uh, we, we are still, you know, coming out of the pandemic and uh, uh, our, our three-year budget, four-year budget, does have us using some reserves uh, rather than uh, requesting large amounts of money. We're, we're uh, using some of the reserves that built up through the pandemic and trying to get ourselves into the black. So as you know, we've been requesting about 1.5% increase uh, year over year. That's well under inflation, um, but we, the board does feel like you know, we need to ask uh, for that regular increase and a modest increase rather than years of nothing and being in the same position of say peace library system which is asking for five percent a year over the next three to four years um, so we're happy to try and, and and work within that we're grateful for your support as we've worked with the province to try and get some more funding out of the province they did come to the table in 2023 we got we moved from 470 per resident to 475 per resident uh, for the system. Your libraries also did get a, a pretty nice uh, increase there as well, so uh, at the, uh, that grant. So we're, we're grateful for your support in writing letters to the province in, in support of that increase. Um, but that is my report. If you have questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer them. Maureen? No questions, just congratulations. Thank you. you have done a magnificent job with Northern Lights since you've become the executive director. And I'm, I appreciate your support of our library. We have three members of our local library board here. They also have been doing a magnificent job. And I think between the two of you, it's all good news. Thank you, Lorraine. We Thank really you. appreciate that. If you haven't been to the library lately, you need to go. They've done some excellent work recently in their renovations. So. Small question. Sure. What's the turnaround times? I know because we loan books throughout this over 60 different libraries. Mm -hmm. What's the turnaround time on someone, say, requesting the latest hot novel or? Yeah, great question. It really depends. So the fastest turnaround time, you know, just to, it, because every library gets uh, a van run once a week, it just depends. It can be as, as soon as 
like two days, uh, even a one day, if it just happens to hit the right, you know, right library at the right time and gets to the van. Um, but, you know, sometimes it'll take a week or more. Uh, electronic books, uh, I'm on hold for some books that'll take six months for me to get. Um, and so your residents should be aware uh, with the electronic books. There's a couple different apps that we use. One's called Libby. Uh, that is a traditional type of library service where we purchase a copy and it's one copy per use and it's got to wait for it to kind of be used and come, to come back into the library system and so it can take quite a while. The other is Hoopla. Hoopla works more like uh, Audible where it's like credits. You get two credits uh, a month as every library user gets two credits a month. Uh, and th those are instant borrows, so there's no waiting in line. Costs a little bit more, but you know it's a, it's a really nice balance. So if you're into ebooks, e audiobooks, we all live in kind of a rural bit of a rural place. If you're driving a lot, you might want to use those audiobooks. I suggest get that Hoopla app and and Libby as well. Yeah. Okay. So just a question about the van runs. Um, are we experiencing any issues like we did four years ago when I was on the board there regarding the maintenance, replacement, all of those things? Because as you know, for Northern Lights, it's quite a wide distance from one area to another. And I know you'll try different schedules, but at the end of the day, those vans can be costly. Yeah, and they are. Um, I mean, the way we break it down, we, we're, we're delivering 800,000 books. It, the cheapest way is to own our own vans and deliver them, you know, use that. We have gone from three routes to two, uh, just incorporating, you know, greater efficiency, still having the same number of spot stops, which is great. We have moved to contract drivers, so we're basically only paying the drivers when they're driving, uh, rather than, you know, full-time staff members with all of that. So that's helped keep it efficient as well. But the cost of vans, uh, well, they're just ridiculous. Pre-pandemic, we bought a van 20, in, I think, 2019. We paid $32,000 for it. I, I put an order in a year, two years ago for a van. It took 18, more than 18 months to get it. Same van, $64,000. So that's 100% inflation. Um, so it's not cheap uh, by any stretch. Uh, but the way every time we break it down um, and we keep tweaking things and um, try to get as absolutely efficient as we can with those vans. So that's definitely one thing that I, I would appreciate in the report is just something like that where it's it sure. be a high cost, mm -hmm. especially when it's probably a five-year turnover for those vans, I would assume. It's more like do lease two to whatever. three years, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. we're Thanks. putting hundreds of thousands of kilometers on them every year. So yeah, I'd appreciate that on that one for sure. You bet. I'd be happy to add that. Thank you very much, James. Can I get a motion to accept this information? Jay or Lorraine? All in favor? Thank you. Carried. Thanks very much for coming out, James. Bet. Thank you. MCS Net, Business Development Manager. Thank you for having me. Mayor, councillors, thank you, CAO, for facilitating the visit on what's turned out to be a very busy council meeting. Um, I do have a presentation this evening, though I, I would like it to be more of a conversation than a presentation, so please feel free to interject at any time. Um, I had an opportunity to discuss this with your CAO uh, prior to this meeting. Uh, he has seen the presentations. We've talked it over. Uh, I'm aware of some of the plans that the town is looking at uh, in the realm of broadband, so I, I compliment you on taking a forward look at things and providing an essential service to the community. I'm here to let you know what we might do in this vein as well. So if we could begin with the first slide, please. So MCSNet is approximately uh, 28 years old. We are a family-owned company, 100% family-owned company. And uh, the family is right from St. Paul. So we are rurally based. And as a matter of fact, all of our senior leadership, with the exception of one, is also born and raised in rural Alberta. And the one exception is from Saskatchewan. She doesn't cheer for the rider, so we accept her. Um, myself uh, is included in that. I was uh, born in, in uh, Sherwood Park, though, but I have lived in St. Paul for 20 years now. 
And uh, I will say that I'm sure every single member of this council is on this council because you believe a certain something about rural Alberta. And we believe the same thing. As a matter of fact, I'm the president of our Chamber of Commerce. So a lot of the views that you have about rural Alberta, we also have about rural Alberta. Second slide, please. As you can see, this is our service area. I won't spend a great deal of time on this. It hasn't really changed much in the last few years. What has changed is the number of subscribers within this area. During the pandemic, we saw quite a dramatic increase in the number of people, naturally, because people were at home more for work, for play, entertaining, educating. The call for internet was, was quite dramatic. We saw quite an increase in our customer base, and I like to say this map went from a light blue to a dark blue during that time period. We currently have just under 25,500 uh, customers. We have, as it says, 540 fixed wireless towers. That's growing. Uh, as we speak, we have just over 2,000 kilometers of MCS net owned fiber and, and three fiber to the premise communities, which we have done. Jerry Grove, Maleg, Fort Kent, and uh, we are currently looking at Thorhild. Those uh, came about because of grants. We are primarily deliver our internet wirelessly. That is, uh, we are what's called a WISP, which is a wireless internet service provider. So our business model is to prevent or provide um, our internet via wireless towers. Next slide, please. So the fiber that we do own, very quickly on this one, transit fiber is what we uh, call it. We have focused on connecting our towers, those 540 towers. Not all of them, but quite a few of them we have connected with fiber. And what a fiber connected tower allows us to do is just increase the speeds uh, to our rural customers. It allows us to launch the technology, which I'm going to talk about in a slide or two. And it also makes our towers future ready for whatever might be coming down the line. So we have invested that 2,000 kilometers of fiber is all tower to tower. Next slide, please. Gig Air is a service that I, I'm here to discuss primarily. It's, it's the one that we're looking at providing to the community. Gig Air is our branded name for a 60 uh, gigahertz wave. Uh, this wave travels at the speed of light, so it's very fast. It offers 1,000 megabytes up, 1,000 down uh, throughout a community without the need for any fiber construction whatsoever. It goes, as you can see, the center picture there. We just put a radio up on the roof and a house will communicate to another house. We call it the mesh network, which you can see the first picture there uh, is a sample of what a mesh network looks like. Houses will work off each other. So we don't necessarily uh, have to require a shot to every single house from the tower because the houses actually serve as part of the network themselves. Uh, some of the disadvantages to this wave is very short distance and it can't make it through a beautiful row of trees. As a matter of fact, a flag will give it trouble. So this is one of the reasons why a network is quite important to us and we've gotten very good at it. We actually have the largest deployment of this technology in North America. So we have uh, innovated quite a bit along this lines. We have uh, some, some redundancies that no one else has to allow us to keep this network strong. And what we will often do if we can't get to one neighbor because they have a row of trees between them, we just go across the street. And once we get somebody across the street, we come back to them. So we build our networks through a community based on our customers. We have done some work where we're trying to do some work with Fortis to use their infrastructure. This is very time consuming. We've had quite a bit of success though, uh, coming into a community and then building up our customer base and building our network via uh, the community. And there's a sample of what a tower looks like there. That one actually is in um, Westlock. No, that's Dewberry. That's the Dewberry Tower. Next slide, please. So our plans for 2024-ish, uh, we are looking at extending our transit fiber uh, uh, through, the, through the county. We're on our way to Morinville. So Highway 28 is going to see some construction. Uh, of course, with the town of Gibbons being along the route, we would love to be able to bring our fiber through the community to feed one of these gig air towers. 
so what we would do is, as you can see, the red line, and this is, all these are at this point, is a line on a map. We haven't done any permitting. We haven't made any formal applications along this line. We've just drawn a line on a map. As a matter of fact, since my conversation with Mr. O'Malley, um, our senior leadership has actually begun uh, looking at the idea that we may not actually require the fiber. We have enough towers in the neighborhood that we might be able to do what's called a licensed link. So we could actually bring uh, the speeds to a tower in town wirelessly from another tower. So there are some other options that we're looking at and I, unfortunately I'm not in that room. So I just know that there's a couple different avenues they're looking at and of course it's on a cost basis. Uh, so the proposed line though, if the fiber does happen, is we would just come down into town up 50th and then back towards the highway. Uh, the line heading up to the rec center there, again, it's just a line on a map. We just showed that it's possible. Um, I sh included uh, an aerial photo from maps of the county shop uh, because that's an area that I would be interested to discuss if it's something that the town is interested in pursuing, uh, the potential of, of taking some land there for a tower. Um, I do like to work with municipalities for this just because of the longevity of the project. We do work with the business community as well. So that is, it is definitely a possibility to do this um, through private landowners. I, I do like to use public lands just because of the longevity. I did a drive through the, the area there. There are a few spots that I, I, I think would, would work. The county, sh or the town shop though, is, is a possibility. Next slide, please. Uh, and then another thing that we do when we bring gig air to a community is we do what's called uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, so we will provide free uh, hotspots to public use spaces within town. Libraries, uh, curling rinks, ag societies, oh, senior drop-in centers, anything that would have a public use, um, we will provide them with a free Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, this does a couple things. Number one, it, it does help promote our service because it, it will provide free internet for, for the public to try out and they can see how it goes, what it, how good it is, and they can get a feel for it when they're at a farmer's market. It allows the nonprofit to have their one less budget item, but, and also for us, it uh, gives us what's called a POP, uh, which I failed to mention earlier in the presentation. Um, when we're building the network, one of the things we look for are what we call POPs, which is a point of presence. They're a first point in the network. Uh, these pops can be up to two kilometers from the tower. And then from this pop, we usually go about 200 meters, 200, 250 meters. That's how far the wave can go. So we can make a two kilometer leap to the first special radio called a pop. And then we go about 200 around there. And quite often we will use these Wi-Fi uh, hotspot locations to offer as these anchor points to give us a place to start in community. We can have multiple spots within a community. We just require a pop to get it going. Next slide, please. Here's a sample of our, well, not a sample. This is our packages. Uh, our most common package is the Giger Ultra, which gives you 2,000 gigabytes. As you see, the speeds are not throttled. So no matter what package you're on, you'll get the same speed. It's the data that's managed. Most people are fine on the Ultra. Um, and we don't lock anybody into a specific plan. So if you, let's say you're a empty nesters and you're on basic, and then December you're going to have your whole family and their grandkids show up with all their tablets and phones, you could bump up to ultra for the month of December and then back down to basic in January. So that's what we're looking at. Next slide, please. And this is a quick look at our business packages. They are a little bit more, but they come with um, static IP addresses, uh, and a very special tech support number where you will get your own tech support person. So uh, your POS can't go down for any length of time. Next slide, please. Thank you. So nice and short, concise. I, I do hope you have some questions for me. Uh, I can fill in the blanks and, and I thank you for your time. Hey, thanks so much for the uh, the presentation. This is great. Uh, curious though, uh, in your mesh network, um, and just your picture shows like seventeen 
houses that are connected is it a shared um, stream then so the more that happen to be on things may slow down a little no bit. actually that that's a very common question uh, it doesn't slow down uh, in the least <coughs> we have communities with uh, 50 60 plus on this system uh, it doesn't slow down because you're dealing with the speed of light and it's really hard to comprehend the speed that we're discussing uh, as a matter of fact early in my tenure here I take I just took a look at it and speed Light will go around the earth seven times a second. If you put light in a fiber optic line, it slows way down. It only goes around the earth five times in a second. So actually the, the fact that we are delivering this primarily wirelessly is actually quicker. Lori? I know almost nothing about what you've been telling us, so my questions may sound very simplistic. Number one, uh, is your service going to be cheaper than what our community members may currently be paying, in, in my case, to Shaw? I don't know what Shaw's packages are, mm -hmm. though I can speak to uh, being an ex-TELUS customer. Mm -hmm. And I was a TELUS customer up until I started with MCSnet, and I had a bundled service, which had my internet, my security, and my television on it and I was paying $270 a month. Our Gig Air Ultra plan is $60 a month. Uh, you can get Amazon for $15, $20 a month. And then security cameras, you can purchase security if you want. So um, from my bundle, it's, it's about half what I was paying to tell us. Um, the biggest leap for me was taking the step away from having my TV provided and once I, I made that step, I got uh, a fire stick. As actually, it was remarkably easy, and we love it now. So I can't speak to what Shaw packages are currently uh, being priced at. I do know that we have been very deliberate with our pricing to make it very competitive in the market. Okay, second question. Um, you are presenting to us as council members what would the town have to do in order to have you come to Gibbons? Just welcome us in. Um, MCSnet is looking at doing this uh, on our own dime, uh, as we have done in other communities. Uh, what we uh, might request, for example, for the tower site, I would be asking for a 12 by 12 foot section of yard space, and that would be the extent of the uh, input from the town. Um, we would be providing this internet as part of our service. So there would be no expense to the town. As a matter of fact, if the town were to um, be agreeable with me using some municipal space for this tower, you would actually get a, an internet credit back that the town could use in this building or another town building, for example, to provide internet to it. So this is, uh, this is something that wouldn't cost the town any money because uh, we would just be looking at just doing this as MCS net. We, are, we wouldn't be looking for our financial investment, even if we decided to bring the fiber uh, through the community instead of the licensed link like, like they're considering. That would not be a shared cost project. That would be an MCS net project. Okay, thank you. What about the security on the net? Because everything is being broadcast, and you've got home-based businesses, you've got home computers, and things like that. How does that stay as, like, your own IP locked in? Because it is broadcast out. Yeah. I can't speak directly to that question. Um, I can get one of our tech um, per people to give you uh, an email back with a more detailed answer to that. Though I will say, we have had no issues with it whatsoever anywhere in our network. Um, the primary area of weakness is the person's own router and their own security with their passwords. Uh, we have never had anybody hack the signal. Uh, you do require a special radio to pick it up, so you can't just drive around and, and take somebody's uh, internet, and it's very hard also to hack it because of the fact that the 60 milli or gigahertz wave is so precise 
um, our installers actually have to use a sight glass and they aim at the house. So it's a very precise um, process and I've never heard of anyone uh, gaining access in the, in the means that you're describing, but I can certainly bring that to our tech people. Yeah, and is there any issues, and I'll use, say, if we've got people working from home, let's use AHS as an example because they may be dealing in medical information. You're looking at FOIP. You're looking at HIA, everything else. Are there, do you have customers who are working from home using? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we do, as a matter of fact, and we do have actually an RCMP uh, station that uses us as a redundancy, so it, it is secure enough for that. And again, the security is primarily the individual's responsibility uh, to make sure that, that the website itself is secure. The signal itself, I don't believe, can be hijacked. So to have MCSnet come to town, it's really an invitation to be another provider like TELUS, Shaw, or whoever you're going through. That's correct. We're just looking to provide an option to the residents of Gibbons. What type, if you did have to run cable, what type of construction would it be and how disruptive would it be going through town? There is going to be some disruption just because of the fact that we're, we're going to be on Main Street. Uh, we have just completed a project through downtown Athabasca. So you could be feel free to, to reach out to them and ask how that went. We do directional drilling. So the, uh, the disruption is minimal as our crew goes through town. That's as fast as we can move through. So they can, they can move a couple blocks a day, uh, I believe, uh, as they go through town. So they are quite uh, apt at coming through communities. We, we work with utilities, of course, very well. We're quite good at avoiding them. The direction drill is uh, a marvelous tool. Um, the plans, of course, this is all would be done through permitting and um, you would have a very good idea of the length of time as we got closer to the project because you would be intimately involved in the process. Okay, and part of the bandwidth and connectivity when you're setting up that net, it's going to take a while for you to generate customers. People use their providers and that. How long until, say, a two-block radius that it's absolutely functional that they can use it at the speeds you're saying? Or is it going to come in and they're going to have intermittent interruptions because it is a wave? What happens is we try to establish these pops as quickly as we can. Um, the way that I, I see this uh, happening, if once we have a tower in sight, we would establish these pops in various locations, um, whether it on a not-for-profit, whether it on a public building, or whether it's on a residence that we have sought out. We would be looking for these pops to get things started as quickly as we could. The service is immediately a thousand up, a thousand down. It, do, it doesn't take time to ramp up, and it doesn't ramp down either as we go. Uh, what will take some time is building up the network um, around those pops. If you're two or three blocks away from one, you can't necessarily get it the first day. You might have to wait until a few neighbors get it on the way. We do have a, a fairly robust crew of door-to-door uh, -door people that will be coming through the community that will speak to it. We, we will come to events to try to promote it. Um, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, we're going to Rainwright to do a sign-up event there just to promote the, the service and try to get as many people going as possible. It is a process, I won't deny it. Uh, it. Sometimes it takes a while, depending on how quickly it's adopted. Again, we're not looking at replacing people's services. We are looking at and making an option. So if somebody has tell us and they're happy with it, we certainly can't say, you know, we need you for your neighbor. But we're hoping to get as many people as possible to have a robust network. And if we require more pops, then we just start putting in more of those because those are our spots where we can start from. Any other questions, Council? Can I get a motion? Or Could you put them on street lights? Uh, again, that would be Fortis. And um, we have worked with them. They're actually quite a good company to work with. 
they're just pretty slow. So we're, we're several years into one project and still haven't quite seen it come to be. So that's why we, we have found that a residential launch goes quite a bit better. And uh, I would actually, if, if you're interested in, in getting a few, having conversations with a few, we are just working uh, in a similar situation with the community of Redwater, as a matter of fact. Uh, you could talk with the CAO there. I'm in, I'm in touch with him quite a bit, Ken. And we have just recently um, taken on services in the community of Smoky Lake as well. So I know the CAO has kind of walked through that process of us taking over a town run um, system. And she's also a customer of ours. So you could get a, a first hand account in both respects. Can I get a motion to accept this information? Dale? All right. All in favor? Thank you very much for your presentation, Thank Kevin. You. And we will get back to you. Mr. Mayor? Yes, ma'am. Could I suggest that we maybe take a 10 minute recess if we have a lot of meeting to get to and everybody might, or that's my suggestion. I mean, I'm. Let's adopt the regular minutes. Sure. And we'll go from there. Just Can I get a, a motion uh, to accept the regular minutes of the council meeting March 13th, 2024? I'll move acceptance of the March 13 minutes. Are there any errors or omissions? All in favor? Carried. 10 minute recess.
will call the meeting back to order 7.1 accounts paid as of March 25, 2024. Motion, please. I'll make. Thank you, Dale. Any questions with regards to the accounts paid? Amber. Thank you. I just um, one question. Um, it's three of five, six, pardon me. But right before the employee's name start, it's NGEM Holdings Incorporated. Anybody know what credit balance refund is and who MGEN Holdings are? It's a 4200 47 $4,800 check. Anybody? Where's the administration today? Monique's out sick. Uh-huh. And... Okay. Anybody? <laughs> Nobody knows what that is? Mayor Deck, members of council, Councillor Harris, I will get the answer for her and I'll send it to the mayor tomorrow. Thank you. That's all for me. Jay. I do have a question. Um, what did the fire department purchase from Guardian Drugs? Mayor Deck, members of council, Council Malante, that would be uh, diabetic <coughs> supplies. We, if we can't get them quick, we go to the drugstore and purchase them so we have them on, on hand right away. Uh, it's a great noticing. Um, I know it wasn't a huge impact on our budget, but I do appreciate that we are buying local. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. 7.2, senior bus repairs. I'll speak to that. Uh, Mayor Deck, members of council. The uh, purpose of this report is to request that council consider the following senior bus repair update. The uh, accident with the seniors bus happened the evening of November 17th, the evening of the um, seniors almost Christmas dinner. Public Works has been working with the only bus repair outlets in this area since then. Parts have been very hard to find and then acquire. The town's insurance was also notified of the damages and a claim was instigated. Once a quote was received from Winfield, it was immediately submitted to the town's insurance company. The results have recently been received. The deductible of $2,500 is payable by the town and the insurance will cover the damages to the front that occurred on November 17th in the amount of $17,271.28. Upon further investigation by Winfield, there is damages to the rear portion of the bus that are not being covered by insurance. So the town will need to cover the extra cost of $10,556.62. This work will bring our seniors bus back into commission. <coughs> Excuse me. The town has been renting the bus from Redwater Seniors Club to provide grocery shopping trips that are desperately needed at this time, but no other bus services have been able to be provided. Administration is strongly recommending that council approve the payment of 10,556.62 so that the Gibbon Senior Bus can be put back into commission. In 2023, the Seniors Bus generated $6,003.52 in rental revenues, and in 2022, the bus rental revenues were $4,335.24. Expenditures for the bus have been seen as follows in 2022, 8,424.23, and in 2023, 12,519.13. On average, when we have our own bus, it's on the road four days of the week, um, and presently we can only run the bus once every two weeks for grocery trips. Uh, we are recommending that council authorize the expenditure of 10,556 to repair the damages to the rear end of the seniors bus that are not under covered under the insurance claim. Get a motion first, and we'll discuss this, please. I move that council authorizes expenditures of $10,556.62 to repair the damage to the rear of the seniors bus not covered under the insurance plan. Okay, the question off the top of my head that I think all the council wants to know, what was the damage on the rear? Was it caused in the accident, and why isn't the insurance covering it? To the best of my knowledge, Mayor Deck Members Council, that um, this was not due to the accident, which is why it's not being recover um, covered under our insurance. Um, I do not know the cause of this, so I can't comment on that. Maybe Eric can. 
Mayor Deck, members of the council, the, the seniors bus, they, when they took it in for the repair done in the accident, they would have certified the whole bus and found these errors in that we knew, knew nothing about at that time. We get it checked every year by Richard Quality Auto and they weren't picked up. So it's unknown how they happened or it, it wasn't caused by the accident itself. Jake? Not sure if anyone can answer this uh, from staff, but how much is the bus currently right now worth? I apologize, I don't have that offhand. Mayor Deck, members of council, Councillor Malante, we'll get to that tomorrow because we do have one going in for a, uh, a grant and we have it priced out, we just don't have the number in front of us. So we should be able to get that off of that grant tomorrow. Amber. Do I read this correctly that we rent the bus from Redwater? Yes, Council Harris, currently, because our bus is out of commission, we are renting the uh, Redwater Seniors Association bus. And how long have we been renting it for? We started renting it in January, so once every two weeks. So, otherwise, it's Redwater's responsibility. No, that's our bus. No, our uh, bus. Yes. We're renting theirs to replace for the grocery store. Okay, checks. good. Okay, because I'm thinking, no, no, no. all right, why? No, no. Um, how did nobody catch this $10,000 repair? Please. Mayor Deck, members of council, this is a guess on my part, but there was a discussion one morning um, when the uh, seniors were dropped off for coffee um, that there was some problems with the lift in the back. So I'm thinking, and, the, and a couple other things, so I'm thinking that that has been there for qu quite some time, possibly when we bought the bus and it was just never picked up because the lift didn't get operated that often until it started being used by, uh, to, to deliver seniors for coffee um, and to pick up seniors at the lodge when they needed to be transported for, for whatever they were going to. Sorry. So it's the actual lift, not the bus. So the certification by, for the bus safety, for its driving ability was good. It's the lift itself. Yeah, that's, that's the way I'm seeing it. It's the, it was the lift when they were talking about it. It was the lift, not the, not the drivability that was okay. Now, I'm not positive that that's what it is. I didn't read all the quotes, and if I did, I still wouldn't probably understand them. Maybe Mr. Law is figuring it out. Lorraine? I was just going to ask about the drivability. If that repair to the rear end was not completed, is the bus safe to be driven? Mayor Deck, members of council, council Mayor, yes, it would be safe to be driven, but after looking at the report there, it looks like it is something to do with the rear lift. Mm -hmm. So then we wouldn't be able to pick up handicap that cannot walk onto the bus itself. We would need to have the lift for them. And there is a, quite a few in the lodge that need that. So. Please. Uh, Mayor Deck, members of council, uh, when um, the bus is used for the seniors almost Christmas dinner, I believe we had probably four people in wheelchairs that night. So I mean, the, the lift is, is necessary. I would hate to see someone get hurt if it didn't work properly. Question on the floor, all in favor? Carried, fix the bus. Councillor Barry. I requested this information just so that people, co council members and the community were aware of the legal costs that the, that the town had been incurring. So I do appreciate the report that's been presented and um, 
I'll leave it at that. It's, it's information for everyone's perusal. So are you making the motion to accept this information? Yes, I am. All in favor? Uh, no. Sorry, I, any I, questions? I, I was looking down at the, no one was looking back. Oh, there's questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, before we accept this as, in, as information, considering administration isn't here today, um, I have several questions about uh, this information. So I'm not, like, I don't, I don't think that we should accept, unless we can bring it back. We can absolutely bring it back. Well, there's... There's I would just caution council that if you accept this as information, yeah. you cannot bring it back. Then you need a you need a motion. for um, a motion for reconsideration. So you either table this item until the next council meeting, or we remove it from the agenda. Would you like to? I would I would like to propose that we remove it from the agenda um, because uh, the individual who can answer questions isn't here. Do we need to defeat the previous motion? There is a motion on the floor. Yes. I would suggest you do a friendly amendment to table it till the next, so it just it just comes forward at the next council meeting. Is that good, friendly amendment? Uh, yeah, in addition to that, Madam Secretary, perhaps you could um, uh, find the FOIP section that this does not fall under, because I believe that this is um, privileged information, so just between now and then. Please. So you accept the friendly amendment that we bring it back to go over. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Nine point one. Legal opinion, pecuniary interest, verbal report. Mayor Deck, members of council, this report is still with the lawyer and we're waiting for his response. So it's not available at this time. Thank you. Do we need a motion on that or can we just wait uh, till the next time because there is no information? There isn't. Well, other than... There was information, so a motion to accept as information would be fine. There was not in... There is. The information is we're waiting for the lawyer's opinion. Why was this put on the agenda then today if we didn't have the information? I'm just curious. This was a request, I, as, if I'm correct, from the last council meeting? And um, uh, CAO O'Malley said that he would get would, he would uh, get a legal opinion, and so we're just giving council the update. So should we table this one maybe as well? Well, there is no information per se, um, other than it's still with the lawyers, so it can certainly be brought for, back as an old business item at the next council meeting. If it's accepted as information? Just the information that was provided to you. But there's no... The only, the only information that provi is provided is that it's still with the lawyers, so it'll come back as old information when the lawyer's opinion comes in. Okay. So it will be on the agenda. All right. Okay. Sure. Okay. Motion to accept this information, please. So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. 9.2, engagement. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and Councillor Barry, I'm really glad that you had said something when the RCMP was here. Uh, when he was speaking about citizen engagement, you had made a comment, um, something to the effect that you were happy that he was getting to know the people in town and uh, what the needs are. So, um, Mr. Mayor, I would like to, in our council procedural bylaw, um, page 10, Madam Secretary, if you need to refer, I am requesting that the mayor um, allow me to invite uh, Daryl Barak to speak on the uh, this matter of citizen engagement or his concerns thereof. And it is number, page 10, I believe, procedural bylaw.
page 10 of 19. Did you find it? I found page 10. Which specific yeah, section? It's item number four, Your Honor. Yeah. Delega delegations who have not submitted a written letter may be granted by the chair or other presiding officer a brief opportunity to outline the matter they wish to present to council. And following that outline, the chair or other presiding officer shall determine if the delegation is to be granted time to present the matter outlined. <laughs> so basically, that being said, Mr. Burak would have to give an outline of what he would like to talk about. Council can then decide whether or not they want that uh, delegate that item to go forward. Um, Delegations who have not submitted a written letter may be granted by the chair or other presiding officer a brief opportunity to outline the matter they wish to present to council and following that outline the chair or other presiding officer shall determine. There's also number um, page 8, pardon me, that may apply. Number 3. The chair or other pres presiding officer may, upon request of a member of council, authorize a person in the public gallery to address council, but only on the topic being debated at that time in a meeting and with time li limits specified by the chair or other presiding officers. So my understanding is that it's Mr. Mayor that decides whether or not a member of the gallery can speak. Sorry, I'm, I was somewhat confused. So your statement just says that we're getting a presentation based on the debate that's going on, but we're not debating anything, so how can we have that type of an input? Mr. Mayor? That was under number eight. Yeah. So it seems to me that it's up to Mr. Mayor to make the decision. That's what I read. And the reason that I'm doing this is that there's been some concern from the community that their uh, ability to speak or be added to the agenda is an issue. And um, I think that a direct pipeline, considering that uh, the um, open mic procedure was not successful. So I'm asking Mr. Mayor if you would kindly allow Mr. Barak to speak at the present time I will not 9.3 um, do we not need a motion shame on you mr. mayor um, if you keep talking you can leave the chambers We don't need a motion, it was a decision. So 9.3. <clears throat> um, thank you. I would actually, maybe I'll, I'll uh, if I could maybe table the code of conduct uh, review. I don't believe that we have, uh, I can put this on for the next um, meeting. 9.3, the code of, uh, we just haven't updated the code of conduct as of yet, I don't believe. I want to say both council procedural bylaw and the code of conduct bylaw came forward previously. Yeah. Um, and so both of those bylaws required a unanimous uh, vote in the third reading and it did not rece receive that. I understand that, but the yeah. code of conduct bylaw actually has to re be reviewed. It uh, hasn't been reviewed since oh, 2018. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's okay. it. Just the, the, to do the review on the update. The code of conduct, okay. Um, Councillor Harris, did you want to put that forward as a motion that administration bring the code of conduct bylaw forward yes. at the next council meeting for review? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. For an update. Up, yeah, update from 2018. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Thank Nine you. 9-4. Uh, all right. Does anybody know what's in our reserve account? Louise. 
$61,500. Okay, thank you. I'll make a motion to accept this information. All in favor? Carried. 11.1, .1, bylaw ALT. 10 -1, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's fine. 10.1, land use and mill rate. Yeah, um, they're actually 10.1 and 10.2. I was trying to, uh, and I had requested as well from um, CAO O'Malley, I was trying to find all of the amendments to the land use bylaw that we've done, well, certainly in the last, ooh, I don't know, three years, and it is very difficult to uh, find them. I know the one that we have on accessible on the uh, website right now is about 140 pages and it's very difficult to navigate through. Um, so I would like to make a motion that the um, land, use, land use bylaws and all the amendments are updated and clearly accessible. Clearly accessible because I can't find any of the, the updates easily. Louise. Mayor Deck, members of council. Yes, there have been a lot of amendments to the, to the land use bylaw since 2006. I can't remember how many. That's why we're doing uh, an updated rewrite of it, bring it up to date. Um, and it will be coming to council um, in the next while, as soon as uh, municipal planning services um, gets it all put together. Um, they've had some staff issues too, so uh, they're still working on it, but notification has been sent out to the community that it'll be coming forward. There will be uh, some information online as soon as it's available, and then it'll come to council before it goes to any public hearings. That's the new. That's the new. But um, you, what you're asking is the, up, the updates. Well, all of the land use bylaws, I, they're the amendments because, I mean, I can go and try and model through the 140 pages but that's 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 probably all we can do is put the 140 pages because that's how big the land use bylaw is no. oh no i realize that but if i want to know what the amendments are they're not easily accessible so i'm just it, well they're not they're no, not, no no I, right like i mean if, if they should be in order we've done a lot of development as of the last five years and um considering that we've made that many amendments to the land use bylaw, granted it's going to be updated. Some of the, I mean, we've had amendments for, for rezoning, not a whole lot of them, um, but there have been amendments, um, yeah, some rezoning, some um, new zones. Um, yeah, and they're, they're over a number of years. Um, they are, I'm sure they're all on the website. Uh, and I'm not sure how else we how can put them on. Yeah, I'll tell you what the problem is. Because our bylaws are, are um, they're L-U-B or A-L-T or whatnot, you know, the, the prefix of the bylaws, they're, unless you know what you're looking for. If it's, an, if it's a land use bylaw change, it's always L-U-B. Yeah, but the general public may not know that. That's what I'm saying. It's It's... If, if somebody wanted to go under land use bylaw, I think that all of those amendments should be readily available at a click, not having to sort through 140 plus pages. Uh, I is it, just... Is there not a database that we keep all of the bylaws? Not a database because we're still uh, mostly paper around this place. So there is a land use bylaw book which shows all of the land use bylaw updates. I think, Councillor Harris, what you're looking for is a consolidated yes. land use bylaw yeah, based, like, right? So it'll have amendment 2-22, amendment 2-24. Can we have those? I mean, I mean, I can check to make sure that all of those updates are on the website, but if you're looking for a consolidated copy, what, we, what that would do literally would be to insert all the amendments into the current land use bylaw. So is that, like when, when they're put online, yeah. right, and I, if I was just to go land use bylaw on search on our website, right, would it bring up each amendment individually? No, it would not. Okay. Because it's the updated approved by law. Yeah, that's what is, is unless... And I get that. And I, we're not the only community that makes amendments like this to their land use bylaw. And a land use bylaw of 100 and some odd pages is, I mean, that's good for a town. A city is probably three times that size at least. Oh, no. I, it's just if I'm, if I'm asked, 
yeah. uh, uh, you know, what district is under what, you know, um, you know, zoning, I don't know offhand. So if I can't go, we can't go back on the, I mean, the agenda packages aren't even available to us, so. Louise. Mayor Deck, members of council, if someone is looking for something specific, like uh, it'd be pretty hard for them to even be able to do that without a zoning map to look and see what, um, like on the wall. Um, so it, yeah, it would be, I mean, even if somebody said, well, what district is this? I wouldn't know off the top of my head. Um, I would go and look. So the best thing, if they have a specific question like that, they can just phone and talk to, to Susan in the office. She has that information all readily available and, and can give it. Um, so at this point, that would be the best until we get the, the whole bylaw. We're trying to make the bylaws so it's more user friendly. Right now, it's not user friendly. It's not user friendly for me, and I use it. I've used it all the time. So it's it's not a user friendly document. Um, so and then we hope that it will be when it's rewritten. All right. Jay. So my understanding of this is it's just a matter of time. Yeah, it's a matter of time. So hopefully um, within the next couple of months, we'll have something for council. But I mean, I can't guarantee that either. Um, it's, it's our contractor. Um, they're very busy and, and having staffing problems, uh, which no, is not our fault. Um, but they are working as quickly as they can to, to get it done. Good. Okay, I'll make a motion to accept this information for now. All in favor. Carried. Last one. 10.2 mill rate. Yeah, um, in, at the end of December when we were going through our, or when we had our budget meeting, um, one of the residents had asked for a mill rate comparison and that was offered. I'm just looking to see if we can have uh, that for a comparison of- Oh, like we've done every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, comparison between municipalities. Yeah. yeah, if we could have that for the- Louise. Mayor Dick, members of council. Um, when we're ready to set the mill rate, then it'll be easier to check what the other municipalities have. Until we can set our mill rate, we haven't got anything to can compare we to. people somewhere for the previous year? Um, just what was put out last year, and I'm not sure if that hit the website or not. Um, it was in our council package as information. Okay, then, yeah, okay. So it should so be on in an old council package. Yeah, the, the, but the specific questions were it's okay. You know what? I'll go back into the in the uh, in the um, and do some research myself. So we'll just leave it at that. I'll make a motion to accept this information. All, right. All in favor? Carried. Eleven point one bylaw ALT nine dash two four short term buying bylaw municipal credit cards. I'll move reading a bylaw ALT nine dash twenty four. Questions, Council? Amber. Um, do we know the, uh, the uh, there's, there's 100 grand in credit cards, that's lots. Boy, somebody could do some damage with that, I bet. Um, do we know who, I know that we there was a listing of who uh, had, do we know the, the um, uh, limits on those cards? Because there's, there's a lot out there right now, right? Mayor Deck, members of the council, Councilor Harris, I know mine for Public Works, there's one for Public Works, it's $10,000. Okay. Um, Stephanie, you have one for Community Services. Excuse me, uh, Council, you'll see on page one of the bylaw, it lists there. So the CAO, Assistant CAO and Executive Assistant have an aggregate amount of $30,000. And then uh, members of Council, Management Staff, SALC, Moment, uh, the fitness manager, librarian, members of community for 70,000. Uh, there, were there any changes to this? No changes other than the expiry date. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Jim. So just from my understanding, I notice it says it's a requirement. We are required by the MGA 
to have a short-term borrowing bylaw for corporate credit cards. And then my, my other question is we have fail safes in place so that there's no misuse of these credit cards, correct? Uh, I think council is quite aware of that. Quite Thank aware. you. How have we been, the last um, bylaw expired December 31st is, and it's March. Yeah, just an oversight. I happened to find it when I was going through the bylaws, is that it, it was just an, it was just an o administrative oversight. Are there any repercussions for that? Um, not that I'm aware of, yeah. other than we don't have a bylaw currently in place, and so we would be in contravention of the MGA. Okay. That's it. I'd like to call the question. Um, okay. All in favor? I'd like a recorded vote, please. Okay. All opposed? Okay. Does anybody want to make a second motion for second reading? I'll make a motion for second reading. Okay. All in favor? Recorded, please. Opposed? I'll make the motion for third reading. Uh, no. Or to have, to have, to have third, third reading. reading. Recorded, please. All in favor? All opposed? Staff reports. Mayor Dack, members of council, uh, community services and public works are starting our interviews for our summer student positions. The Sturgeon River Egg Society is hosting an Easter egg event in partnership with us at the GCC on the 30th. And there's a drop-in presentation from Service Canada on their programs on April 22nd at the Do Drop In. Uh, everyone is welcome to attend. Uh, that presentation and there's also an opportunity if someone needs one-on-one um, -on -one time they can book that time through the Gibbons Family Resource Centre to have a meeting with the Service Canada representative as well. Phil. I'm just curious about your progress on finding youth coordinator. Mayor Deck, members of council, uh, Council Ushishin, uh, we currently have an offer out on the table we're just waiting for a response. The drop-in presentation that is going to be held at the Dew Drop, does that mean the professionals from Service Canada will be there for like for an afternoon and people can just stop in and consult with them on whatever it is that they're concerned about? Councillor Barry, so from um, 11 till 12, they're going to be there just doing an overview on their programs for the general drop-in portion. If you do want that one-on-one -on -one appointment where you can talk about whatever program you're looking for information on, um, those are happening from 12 to 3, but they do need to be booked in advance for that portion. Okay, thank you. Louise, do you want to... Uh Mayor Deck, members of council, um, the business breakfast I thought was uh, was a success. We had a uh, few more businesses than we normally do. Um, registration forms for the golf tournament went out today. We wanted to get them out fast because uh, Sturgeon County is holding theirs the day before. So um, we want to get as many registrations as we can. Let's beat them. <laughs> That's all I have. Meredith, members of the council, I'll do uh, corporate service. Uh, uh, Ms. Jeffries is off ill. Uh, she's been working on the audit, tax enforcement, tax sale preparation, and the 2023 annual report. <laughs> she has been quite busy. Um, the uh, public works, water meter installation is going good. Our electronic sign is working well. We are finding some meters that are embedded into walls like you would not believe. So we have to talk to the homeowners and get them out so we can get the new one in. And it, it's been a challenge in a few homes. So, um, and then we're getting all these little minor projects done since it's, uh, the snow has been really good, knock on wood. Uh, fire department, 2024 town calls, add three to that since Monday, 38 and county calls, add three to that to 44. So we've been busy the last few days. Memberships currently at 27 and the level one training program is ongoing. 
The project's uh, cottage uh, where start date is still to be determined. Uh, Memorial Park. Any news on that, Stephanie? Still waiting on the uh, okay. status of the grant. Uh, Heartland Station, I had a signalization pre-construction meeting held on Monday. We should be starting that when all the frost is out of the ground. Uh, grocery store to start up other dependent. Their goal is to have it opened uh, the end of the year, so I'll say December. But then again, it depends on the construction season. If we have bad weather when it starts, it's going to slow them down and back them up. So it's just normal stuff. That's their goal is December. So, and the commercial retail unit, they'll be built alongside of that. Okay. Jay. So just a question on fire. Um, you mentioned the town calls and county calls. How many of them were medical and are we going to continue billing AHS for the added service costs? Councillor Malati, I can't give you the exact breakdown. I have, don't have it in front of me, but we're not going to bill AHS. They are going to pay us about every six months. So we'll send something in, and it's based off of uh, personal care reports that we send in when we do medical calls. So that's what they base that off of. So, so I just want to continue this discussion, and um, it, it's been a big, long road for your service to get AHS to pay the bills for the medical calls that our fire department goes out. So I do appreciate this. And uh, from my understanding, our town has been leading this in some parts uh, regarding AHS paying up for the added service, the gas, the volunteer firefighters that come out at a cost. So good on you. Thank well, you. Well, that's why the minister came here with the medical first responder money. So Absolutely. Thank you. Motion to accept his information, please. Deal. All in favor? Carried. Committee reports. Norm. Okay, March 14th, I went to Edmonton Global Zoom meeting. And then the evening, I went to victim service preparation for their AGM. March 19th, attended the North Edmonton Business Association Mixer. March 21st, victim services AGM the provinces decided that uh, victim services are no longer required. They divided them, the entire province into four regions. They're hiring a bunch of people to replace the existing victim services group. And uh, I'm not sure how it's going, but they expect that by September 1, there will be no longer any victim services groups associated with any of the detachments. It'll be divided, like I said, pro whole province divided into four areas and it's going to be a wonderful thing according to them. Uh, March 25th, I attended the Water Commission meeting. Thank you. Norm, does that include all the volunteer advocates that go out and do the home visits? Yeah, they, there is no, there won't be any volunteers anymore. The, the province is going to be hiring them. So I, that's the be latest information that I have. Thank you. Willis. Uh, March 14th and 15th, the Spring Municipalities Leaders Conference. Um, March 14th, the morning, the Global Shareholders Meeting. Uh, the evening of the March 15th, the Parkland County State of the Region. March 18th, the Proven uh, Provincial Press Conference at uh, the Aero Utilities Plant, where the province gave us a $50 million grant, which is awesome for the upgrade. Uh, March 20th, the Gibbons Business Breakfast, the 22nd, uh, Aero Utilities Board Meeting, and today, this morning, the ribbon cutting ceremony for the new hydrogen fueling station in Nisku. Nothing to report. Lorraine. On March 20th, I attended the business breakfast here in town. On that same day, I took part in a Zoom meeting with the people who are responsible for the Dolly Parton program. Our library board is seeking to implement the Dolly Parton program here in Gibbons. Uh, this program would allow for families of children, preschool children, to register and the children would receive age-appropriate books once a month for uh, 
until they reach the age of five. Um, the in initiating the project requires some funding and that's what the board is working on right now is to, um, to get that funding in order. When it is, the, that will be initiated and hopefully come this fall we'll be registering families for this program. Uh, one of our staff members currently has her child enrolled in the program and is quite excited to see it continue. So I'm excited as well. I think it'll be a good thing for children, well, families of children who are zero to five and uh, encourage their literacy and, and preparedness when they get to school. Um, over and above that, uh, last night I was at the, Lib the Gibbons Library Board meeting. Uh, that's where I learned all of this information and more. As I said earlier, our library board is very active and doing fantastic work. That's it for my report. Jay. On March 20th, I attended the Gibbons Business Breakfast. It was great to meet a lot of the, the new owners that have joined. I'm hoping to get more engagement with more uh, businesses coming in. Thank you for setting that, that up, Louise. And then uh, with regards to March 21st, I attended the Sturgeon River Watershed Alliance meeting. And in those discussions, just for those who don't understand, is we, uh, we have discussions regarding wetland strategy and the river is 260 kilometers long. So everything from riparian policy to state of the watershed purposes, things are being discussed. And uh, there's a recent uh, connection that I had from some Nate students earlier uh, that I'm going to be seeking some engagement from administration uh, regarding some of their findings. So I think it'll be great to uh, create that communication nexus uh, with the uh, SRWA and then obviously with our town regarding our uh, riparian rights as well as the watershed conditions currently. Deal. On March 14th, um, I also attended the Edmonton Global Shareholders Meeting. And March 20th, I attended the uh, Gibbons Business Breakfast. And also on the 20th, I attended the Hydrogen Hub webinar regarding hydrogen safety. All right. On March 14th and 15th, I attended the Spring Municipal Leaders Caucus. Um, the great concern with emergency preparedness throughout the province is the significant lack of water. Um, the snows have helped significantly, but not enough at all down south. Um, they were showing pictures of the Old Man River and that, and you could see the bank probably 200 meters from the picture where it normally would be wet. All you saw was silt. The water levels, the fire season, um, the government has ramped up significantly. Uh, we also had addressed <coughs> by the Premier. Uh, at the same time, I attended the Global Edmonton Proton Announcement. For those of you who didn't see it on Global News, um, those of you who remember Ben Stelter, the young fellow who died of cancer, his uh, foundation in conjunction with the Oilers and conjunction with major investors. The major investors came to Edmonton to bring a proton treatment device to Edmonton. Edmonton Global put the right 20 people in the room to actually make it happen. It's a $100 million investment and it'll be the first proton device in Canada and we're the last G7 nation to actually get one. And what was really interesting is Ben's dad spoke. Right after he passed away, he got cancer and had to go to Philadelphia for nine months and be treated by this device, which was a significant impact because though Al Alberta Health covered the cost of the treatments, they didn't cover the cost of the flights, the everything else that went along with it. So, and the layman's term for it is the proton device is like the head of a pin when it's treating cancer. Whereas radiation in the old scope hit the whole body. This actually hits the tumor and it's 
just cutting edge, but it's also tied in with the U of A and their research department. So it's going to continue developing with the medical care and it's just a great thing coming forward and I'm very proud that we're a member of Edmonton Global and we're, they were able to put the right people in the room because it's going to save lives in Alberta and across the country. Um, on March 15th, uh, <coughs> took, uh, went to the State of the Region address out in Parkland County. Uh, very good event with the three mayors, William Choi, uh, Bill, <coughs> and Jeff Acker. Um, they have figured out regional collaboration on working together. They are not arguing and fighting over businesses. They're working to bring it to whoever needs it and where it fits best within their area. And it's benefiting all their communities. Um, <coughs> on March 18th, I was part of the Edmonton Global Working Group. I also attended the area utilities um, press conference and saw the development. If you go out by the water treatment plant, the amount of work they've already done is uh, huge. Um, in the afternoon, I spent it reading at Landing Trail School. On the 20th, I attended the business breakfast. Thank you very much, Louise. That was well turned out. It was nice to see new faces in there, as well as our uh, regulars. Um, on the 21st, I attended the Rose Ridge Landfill Commission meeting, and uh, you'll be seeing changes at Rose Ridge because there will be, we'll be moving forward with the construction projects on that site to clean it up even more than it has been over the last two years. So, And on the 27th today, the new hydrogen fueling station announcement and opening in NISQ. The maximum range of the one semi is approximately 500 miles or 800 kilometers, which would be almost ideal if we had a fueling station from here because it could make Fort Mac, the Fort Mac run and back just about, and it could also make uh, Cold Lake and back. And that's the first one in the region. That ends my report. I get a motion to accept his information. Jay. All Mr. Mayor, yes, I just wanted to comment on your talk about the drought. Uh, going back to the Water Commission meeting on Monday, the uh, current consumption for the uh, northeast zone and around the city is, is 35 billion cubic meters a year. The water license is good for 60 billion cubic meters a year. And so we have no concerns here about any uh, uh, water shortage at all, other than processing and purifying the water. Thank you. Motion? Motion Thank you, Jay. All in favor? Carried. Correspondence, 14-1 from the town of Bonacord. I get a motion to accept this information, motion please. Information. All in favor? Carried. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>